Our next speaker, Johnny Lewis, um, he first, he's an artist and photographer. He first exhibited in 1974. He was a member of Sydney's Yellow House. In, in 1977, he was amongst the founders of Greenpeace Australia, which led the successful campaign to end the slaughter of whales. Um, his interests are reflected in his photography and when not on the hop, photographing or teaching, he lives in the Southern Highlands, New South Wales. Thank you, Johnny. Uh, congratulations, Chris. That was that was great, and I'll put a plug in for my friend here because that book is uh, our, our legacy here in Australia, uh, The Last Whale. It's a fabulous book. It's crammed full of information, and it gives us something of a culture, our maritime culture, and indeed our culture with whales. So my story is um, highly complex and very very simple at the same time. I was interested in whales and dolphins. I lived up on uh, the north coast of um, uh, New South Wales and near Byron Bay. I'd seen the whales come and go. I'd, I'd surfed with dolphins and I got antsy about what was happening and joined Project Jonah and started writing letters and that didn't last very long because it was really boring. Funnily enough, I, it was one of those serendipitous meetings, I met Jean-Paul Fortemgaon, whose name you'll hear in Australian whaling uh, forever on, uh, and a day. Uh, a tremendous character, he's still going. He's absolutely passionate with, um, with uh, the idea of saving whales. And I met him at the International Whaling Commission in Canberra, and uh, I, I nicknamed him the Phantom, uh, because I brought an art exhibition down to Canberra that was whale orientated. And I said to him, um, you're the phantom of this particular, because he spoke so beautifully at the opening address, and I thought he was just magnificent. So I said, you're the phantom of this, organ this uh, International Whaling Commission. You've said something so wonderful and profound. A few days later, he asked me, would I like to work for the phantom? I said, what have you got in mind? He said, we'll put the whaling industry out of operation in Albany, Western Australia. It didn't take me too long, but I thought, why not? You know, and I was at that impressive age, and I think I, 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 the, the numbers are never the same, but I think it might have been $800 that he gave me in cash that, that said, you crank it up, Johnny, he said, and then left. So there I was in a studio in New South Head Road in Sydney with this money, which I put into an account, and we started organising a group that would run a campaign similar to what we had seen in Greenpeace. And uh, indeed, that's what we did. It was an extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary thing. Um, and it, I, I was so lucky to work with Jean-Paul. We so lucky to work with um, Bob Hunter. Bob Hunter, I think, is one of the great ecologists of the world, and his 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 fame or his acknowledgement will come with time. I mean, uh, he, I don't know whether you know, but he stitched three wonderful things together with the philosophy and psychology of Greenpeace. And one was uh, to bear witness, which was a Quaker thing. Another one was the Gandhi philosophy of nonviolence. And the third one was uh, the return of the, the warriors of the rainbow and the indigenous people of uh, British Columbia they came back to save the earth. So those sort of three things were what uh, Hunter came up with and, uh, and, and indeed was the driving force behind the Green Bean philosophy and still is today. Uh, so, um, Albany, Western Australia, oh, there I am. It was a long time ago. <laughs> uh, just leave it there, go back. <laughs> That's Pat Farrington in the middle and that's Jean-Paul on the other, the other side of us. That's when we were cranking up uh, here in Sydney, trying to get some interest and trying to learn what we do. Maybe we just go through the photographs. Um, this is one of our posters. We, we originally called ourselves the Whale and Dolphin Coalition. Uh, and then that morphed into as many uh, people that we could steal their... Um, byline as we could. I mean, we were Greenpeace, we were Project Jonah, we are International Whale Fund. We didn't care. We were rather careless. 
I mean, we never told the people exactly what we were doing. And we wanted that, that idea that there were all these disparate groups heading to Albany to stop the whales. And uh, it was just one group and it was us. So uh, this is Bob Hunter in front of the post that we just saw before. Dear Bob Hunter, I mean, I think, what a great man. Here, this is uh, part of the um, protest. You can see the police. I'm in there somewhere with a megaphone. The, the fascinating thing, that, and I love these stories, I hope they translate, uh, when all this was happening and getting quite tense, uh, as Chris explained, um, the, the, the fellas were really being intimidating and we thought we, we could probably get bashed up. But just at that moment when you thought the tension couldn't be ratcheted up anymore, a little kid ran up the beach and said, dolphins! So everyone turned around, looked at the beach, it dissipated all the violence and tension that was in the air. And sure enough, just off the whaling station where we were protesting was a pot of dolphins. So the whole thing kind of, you know, dis dissipated and, and we got off the hook. So, ah, now you probably recognise my hair. Um, just above this gentleman, that's me with the megaphone, and this gentleman who's looking very earnestly like he wants to kill me is uh, one of God's garbage, the infamous bikey group from Al Albany. Anyway, uh, there were so many stories. I, please buy the book. That it was, it was uh, a wonderful, wonderful time. I, I remember, you know, you have days in your life where you just remember the whole day. You know, and that, that day that uh, Jean-Paul and I, we had some, I remember we had some sandwiches that uh, we had in the boat. We had extra fuel, we had extra water. And I remember sitting in the lee of a little island in Albany Harbour at three o'clock in the morning, freezing cold, waiting for the whaling boat to come out. And of course, by, we started following it. By eight o'clock when these whalers knew we were following them, they went directly south into the uh, Southern Ocean. And, you know, I was younger and sillier and you, you, don't, you don't fear anything when you're that age. So we went, it was, a, it was a marvellous feeling because we'd in fact put one third of the Australian whaling uh, industry out of action. They had to contend with us and so they tried to get us into trouble, which I'm glad to say they didn't. Uh, and from that moment on it started getting quite serious. Um, there were a few threats and it was tough to go into the pub as we did that day after spending the day at sea playing cat and mouse with uh, uh, Case van der Gag's boat, the Shane's Three or Two, I think it was the Shane's Three. So uh, I remember we, got, we started at three o'clock in the morning, we got back at eight o'clock at night, seven o'clock at night and we tethered the Zodiac. People thought we were dead. We walked up the street and into the bar of the pub. And of course the whalers were there and we nodded and said hello and we ordered a couple of beers and uh, behaved very coolly. Mind you, we were freezing. And uh, we just, uh, from that moment on, it started getting a little bit serious. Maybe, so most people know that it wasn't just Greenpeace or the Whale and Dolphin Coalition or any of the disparate groups. It was a whole bunch of people. It was like you and me and all of us, I think, the whole, that, that changes these sorts of things. And indeed, we, um, you know, we, we were a small part of something that was really, really big. And um, it was just life-changing, I think, in many ways. Absolutely. Well, I know it was for me. I went back to Albany. Now, in, in, during, in 1977, while we were there, we didn't get served fuel. We couldn't rent a place at the, in a mo they wouldn't give us a motel. We believed, and we've got no proof of course, that some of our outboard engines had been tampered with, you know? And when an outboard engine fails you, you know, 20 or 30 miles out to sea, you start getting a little bit niggly. Um, there was, so there was some very, very bad feeling. But the good feeling was just as, just as amazing too. Um, but subsequently, the year later, they stopped whaling. And I think that the day it was announced there was a whale that swam into Sydney Harbour. I've got to check that, but I'm pretty sure that's the, that was the case. 
And then years and years later, I was invited to come down to Albany and um, uh, open the Fight for 50, which was the World uh, International, Fund for International Fund for Animals. And um, by this stage, the whalers had all become pro-whale. They didn't want to see, they didn't want to, well, the law had changed. They didn't want to kill whales. And um, so I went down, Chris was with us, and we took the plane from Perth. And I remember the captain got on the plane, and this is always, I always remember this. He said, um, when we're flying at such and such a feet, and we just like to make a warm welcome to Johnny Lewis, who was, was here with Greenpeace uh, in 1977, which is a, you know, I thought, oh my God, I can't believe you know, It was very, very flattering. We got off at Albany, um, uh, sorry, yeah, Albany Airport, walked through the reception there, and there was the two whalers waiting. And I walked up, we shook hands, we embraced, and within minutes, one of the whalers had pulled me aside and said, Johnny, we're terribly sorry what happened in 1977. Just <coughs> am amazing. Those guys had been carrying all of that for all that time. And, they, and then when I arrived out of the blue for this, uh, for this uh, occasion, that they, they were there to meet me and to start healing the rift that we obviously felt in 1977. Um, I got to know one of the whalers very well. There was two of them, Paddy Hart and Case Van de Gag. I got to know Case very well. And he was a man who, who was revered by every boy and every man in Albany, you know, as the, as the head whaler. And uh, I got to know him and I found he, he was profoundly sad about his life. And um, he was doing his best to sort of weigh the ledger, if you will. Um, and the most amazing thing happened um, apropos of this. Uh, Paddy Hart was, uh, uh, and it happened through Greenpeace and Steve Shalhorn, some of us know, uh, he was the Greenpeace president uh, a few years ago here. And um, when we talked, when we talked it out with the, the, the whalers and when we just re-established some sort of connection, he suggested to Paddy, would he like to go to Japan and lecture throughout Japan as an ex-whaler to the Japanese? And I thought, what, what an extraordinary kind of circle. It's gone full circle, the whole loop's gone full circle. And now these guys giving them, in a sense, their dignity back to do some good for the whales. And Paddy Hart had never been overseas before. So that's just a little um, story. With, uh, oh, this is one of my photographs, um, made in the Shanes too. <coughs> very frightening having a harpoon go over your head. Very, very frightening. Um, Tom Barber, my colleague, uh, Jean -Paul and Jean-Paul, they were very, very lucky. They had the, the line that tethered the harpoon to the boat uh, fouled the uh, engine and um, they were very, very lucky to, to escape with their lives. Um, and it's a, it's a ghastly experience. I don't think Tom has really recovered from um, the two harpoons that were fired over his head. They really gave him a fright, gave everyone a fright. So uh, Jean-Paul, of course, uh, with the Shanes too. So, um, where do I go from here? I'd like people to ask some good questions, some, some tough questions about it all. Um, and uh, maybe I should leave it off and ask, say thank you for listening to me and I hope I get more articulate as the day goes by. Thank you. <laughs>